Hello, reading world. Uh, have you ever thought about how you would react if you came across another you? Uh, someone just like you in every way, and not just someone with the same personality and appearance and everything, but who actually shares the exact same experiences as you, aside from what's happened in the last three months? That is one question explored in The Anomaly by French writer Hervé Le Tellier. This book was a huge success in France in 2021. Uh, it was translated from the original French into English by Adriana Hunter and narrated by Dominic Hoffman uh, in the audiobook version I listened to. I originally heard about it from a review in the New York Times. The Anomaly is a bit of a mix between literary fiction and science fiction, exploring the lives of quite a few different characters who all happen to have been on the same flight from Paris to New York in March of 2021. I'll save the major spoilers for the end, but right off the bat, I'm going to spoil a few things that are revealed early on and really also are in the brief synopses you'll find anywhere you read about the book. I just wanted to give you the full warning there. I don't think it will hurt your experience of reading. In another article I read after finishing the book, I think this was actually another one from the New York Times, Le Tellier himself talks about the process of writing the novel and the way this whole idea took shape in his mind. He specifically describes the novel as having three parts, exposition, explanation, and confrontation. First, the exposition of the characters in this weird phenomenon, the anomaly, then the explanation of what's going on here and how the characters react to it. And finally, the confrontation that ensues on a personal level and as the characters meet with their other selves, as well as the confrontation in the broader society as the world grapples with the implications and the fallout of this troubling occurrence. I like that framing of the novel because it's not just this vague outline. It really is very clear while reading this novel that it is broken down into three parts like this. And in fact, this framing also begins to break the novel down into the aspects that I liked and didn't like. Of these three parts, there was one that I thought was done really well, one that I thought utterly failed, and one where I think certain aspects of it worked, but others didn't. So let's start with the exposition of the problem and of the characters. Uh, the first part of the novel was excellent. I absolutely love the way Le Tellier creates his characters in this book. Uh, for almost a third of the book, we're being introduced to more and more new characters, with only a chapter at a time for each. But with each new introduction, I still enjoyed meeting this diverse set of human beings. Le Tellier has a knack for really painting realistic portraits, understanding what's making these people tick, not reducing them to simplified versions of actual people. And they're really distinct, too. Le Tellier doesn't fall into the trap of creating a bunch of characters who occupy different roles in the world, but all in all then end up being more or less bland variations on the same core basic personalities. No, each of these characters really has his or her own quirks, none of which fully defines the character, but which all together really add up into something very human and relatable. And like I mentioned, what impressed me the most about this is that often in a book with so many characters, you find yourself a bit bored with some of them after they fade from memory and are replaced with newer and maybe stronger characters. But here the characters all just left such a lasting impression that even the very first character we meet, a contract assassin, who we won't be seeing much more of for quite some time, uh, won't be one that we're forgetting anytime soon. And yeah, you might be thinking, okay, Mike, you didn't say that this was an action thriller novel, and it's not. The Contract Assassin really had me thinking one thing when I started the first chapter, but you'll soon see that this is just one of the many character portraits, uh, most of them compelling in less striking and more subtle ways. If you've already read the story yourself, I'm curious what your first impressions were of the characters as a set, uh, considering them all as part of one bigger story. I personally noticed that all of them, or at least the vast majority of the characters we met, seem to have a certain sense of disillusionment with their lives and with the world. There's this mostly unstated but unmistakable realization running through the minds of all these characters as we meet them, a realization that the world is not as nice and tidy as they once saw it, that the dreams they once had are not really achievable in the way that they imagined them. And this takes different forms for different characters, as it should, but it really creates a cohesive feel to the first part of the novel, and it sets up the reader and the characters for events to come. For one character, Andre, it's the discomfort and insecurity of growing old, or older, as he's still probably got plenty of life ahead of him to live. For his partner, or ex-partner, Lucy, it's a wondering whether there really exists a relationship in which she can feel comfortable in herself, where she can maintain her own identity rather than being swallowed by uh, the partner's life. A desire that perhaps in itself prevents her from really connecting with any would-be romantic partner. 
Uh, for the newly minted Nigerian pop superstar Slim Boy, it's a tension between truly being himself and being the person he's now expected to be in the public eye, a responsibility he's pretty much unable to avoid now that he's received the success most artists like him could only dream of. And I'm skipping over quite a few other really interesting characters here too, but you can fill the gaps in yourself. Uh, for one of the characters, the author and translator Victor Misle, this sense of disillusionment is the most striking as it leads him to a profound sense of meaninglessness and ineffectualness that eventually propels him to a final act of suicide as a sort of paradoxical attempt to create meaning to his existence. His chapter is quite powerful and surprisingly not as dark as you might think given where it leads him. It feels more like an act of resistance to this sense of nihilism or fatalism rather than something born of profound despair or depression, but as we then see the aftermath of this act, how it leads him to recognition and rockets his final book to bestseller status, how it creates friends for him who never thought to come forward and say so, or even to mention reading his books while he was alive, it feels as if he's playing some sort of dark joke on the world, making a claim that he had a more profound impact on the world around him by no longer existing than he had when he did still exist. And this really sets the stage and starts the gears turning in our minds about what role these characters play in the world, whether they actually do have any impact on the world and the people around them, and if they do have an impact, is it one worth having? Is it even one that they can take credit for, or is it, as the late Victor Measle might have said, simply where fate and circumstance have led them to be in this moment? From this last character description, you might be thinking, wow, this sounds like it's set to be a dark, depressing, brooding sort of book. And I don't want to go into these philosophical rabbit holes right now, but I'll just say it's also really not that type of book. The characters raise interesting philosophical trains of thought, but thinking about these deep questions isn't a requirement for enjoying the book or these characters. And at least at the start of the book, I suspected that Le Tellier's point in including these big questions in his character's thought processes was neither to argue in support or in favor of a fatalistic or nihilistic point of view, but to sort of see if he could step around it. And I don't want to turn this into some sort of philosophy book review, but just in brief, what I mean by that is, as an example, if you've ever talked with people about, let's just say, whether humans have free will, you could say, yes, I want to think we have free will because it's the only way life has any meaning. You could also say, no, there's no free will. Everything's predetermined. So what's the point of life? I'm basically just a program doing whatever the biophysical processes say I should do. Wow, isn't that really depressing? But probably a lot of us will just say, I'm just going to go grab a cup of coffee and duck out of this conversation. I'm not sure that I could prove that this decision to get a cup of coffee was done perfectly freely, but it seems free from my frame of reference, so good enough for me, and let me know when the conversation is over so we can talk about something else. And I figured, if anything, what Le Tellier was trying to do philosophically with this book was to take more of that third route, the stepping around route, instead of either trying to disprove this kind of theory or to accept the depressing implications that some might fear follow from such a theory. Enough of that, though. I think if you're interested in the question, there will be a lot for you in that direction in the first part of the book, but for most readers, it'll be the richness of the characters that keeps you captivated. And also because although this novel hints that it's going to push us to explore these questions more deeply and really see what becomes of these characters' disillusionment, it doesn't. The pinnacle of the character development has been reached by the end of this first of three parts of the book, and the rest of the book will be just tying up loose ends on that front. After all, this book is called The Anomaly, and so far we've seen nothing truly anomalous, which is where we're going to head in the middle part of the book. And that's where things get weird. As much as I loved the character exposition in this novel, the sci-fi plot took the book down a different road that originally hinted at great potential, but in my opinion was overly ambitious and mostly failed. You see, I think this book could have been much stronger with a simpler sci-fi plot, or even one where the anomaly remained simply an anomaly. A little glitch in the story and in the world as we know it, uh, that remained mostly inexplicable, but that somehow augmented the character development or even radically altered the trajectory of their lives through some seemingly slight perturbation. Instead of what actually happened, which involved calling in the FBI, the U.S. military, President Trump, I mean, the President of the United States, unlike every other leader in the book, President Trump is not named, but just described. Then there are some unnecessarily quarrelsome religious leaders and a bunch of pseudo-scientific conspiracy theorists whom we're expected to trust not on the actual merits of their arguments but because they have degrees from fancy universities. But as an example, here's where I thought the story might go after reading the first part. And this is where there'll be some minor spoilers but nothing too major yet. 
I thought that this flight turbulence was essentially going to split this world into two possible worlds, sort of parallel universes, one where the flight hit the turbulence and one where it remained mostly unscathed, and that these stories would diverge and explore the ways in which characters' lives radically diverge as a result of this seemingly subtle perturbation, some butterfly effect uh, or chaos theory or whatever you want to call it. I didn't know exactly how this would fit in with other themes exposed in the first third of the book, but I thought there were ways that it could turn out really interesting, and I was curious to see what happened. After all, if I already knew where it would go exactly, then it probably would be less interesting and thought-provoking of a book, right? Instead, though, we actually have both diverging storylines end up in the same world, and that could be interesting too, but unfortunately it's actually where things go off the rails with the sci-fi plot. I'm not going to say just yet where it goes, but it's not great, and although some of the middle part of the book was, I'll admit, entertaining, the science fiction plot points were often more frustrating. And yeah, I'm a scientist myself, so you might be like, oh come on, give them a break, it doesn't have to be perfectly realistic. But that, for me, isn't the problem, and I want to explore that a bit deeper here. How would it have worked better, and why didn't it work here for me? For that, I have to ask the question, what goals might an author be trying to achieve? with science fiction writing, either as a genre or a subgenre. I'm going to suggest three such goals, which are not exhaustive or mutually exclusive even, uh, but which I think are three goals that really make a science fiction plot enjoyable for me when any or all of them are achieved successful. Goal number one, uh, the plot introduces a scientific mystery, a strange phenomenon that the readers can work to solve along with the central characters. Many of Michael Crichton's work, such as The Andromeda Strain, which I reviewed on this channel, or Andy Weir's Project Hail Mary, which I am going to review on this channel if I haven't posted that already, fit this mold. Such a plot may also involve problem solving or characters with different skill sets working together to deal with a scientific crisis, but it doesn't necessarily have to explore the actual effects of this crisis on broader society. Neither of those works I just mentioned really investigates deeply the effects on the world as a whole. They're more interested with solving the scientific mystery. Goal number two might be the plot explores some potential fictional world and how a deviation in this world from accepted or known scientific laws in our world uh, affects society as a whole. There are many good examples of this in Star Trek. For example, I'm making this up, but it could easily be a Star Trek plot. Uh, maybe it actually is. Our bold explorers arrive on a planet where the only life forms are robots. We learn that the robot's way of living is drastically different than in human societies because the robots function as a collective and no individual robot's life is particularly sacred. Each is willing to expend itself for the good of the unit. Okay, as I'm saying this, I think this actually might be related to an actual Star Trek plot about the Borg, which runs through a lot of the episodes. Sorry if you're a Trekkie. I'm a fan, but not that big of a fan, so I don't remember all this. In any case, much of the fun of such a plot is learning about how the science fiction scenario affects the broader society that we're observing. And a third and final goal we might see is, often paired together with a second goal, we explore how a deviation from the expectations uh, in the world affects an individual on a personal and psychological level. So here I'll invoke one of the most famous sci-fi writers, Franz Kafka. Uh, when Gregor Samsa awakes transformed into a giant beetle in Metamorphosis, we're not really concerned with the question of how this happened, nor will we deeply explore how this affects a society as a whole that a man has turned into a giant bug. If anything, Kafka just implies that his disappearance has no effect on the world whatsoever, other than that his manager is really mad at him for not being to work on time. This book centers more, though, on how Gregor Samsa's own experiences are affected by this transformation. And okay, for a more science-y example of this, how about Star Wars? I again realize Star Wars is a little more down the road of fantasy than hard sci-fi, but think about the main character in the original trilogy. Luke Skywalker lives in a sci-fi world. What's his life like living in that world? Is it different from ours? How is it affected when Uncle Ben reveals to him that Luke can actually harness this hidden power called the Force? Now, a science fiction plot doesn't have to accomplish all three of these goals, but if it makes it clear that it's trying to accomplish one of them, it should succeed. An episode of Star Trek is fine if we observe that a planet is populated by robots but don't learn why they were put there, and instead explore how the society works. It's not so effective, though, if it leads us for the first half of the episode down a question of how these robots got there, and then Captain Picard just throws up his hands and says, well, I can't figure it out, I'm just going to assume without much evidence at all that they must have been sent here by this giant AI called Borg, because that's one possibility, so it must be right. Now let's proceed with the rest of the episode as if this is true and established fact. Similarly, Star Wars would be unsuccessful if, for example, Luke learned that he could use the Force, 
uh, tried it, decided he didn't like it, and then went back to his normal work on Tatooine and just forgot that Uncle Ben had ever mentioned it. Much of the effectiveness of the science fiction element, the Force, comes from the fact that it leads Luke across the galaxy to fulfill some cosmic purpose and restore balance to the universe. So, coming back to the anomaly, the reason why the science fiction plot in the anomaly mostly fails is because it attempts to do all three of those goals, but only really succeeds at the third. Goals one and two are suggested and pursued for a little while, but then end up feeling more like fakeouts by the end. For example, there's goal one. What is this scientific anomaly? How is it happening? How can we use our intellect and research to figure out what this anomaly could be? Well, we're not actually encouraged to explore possible explanations. A few of them are thrown out, uh, and then the experts tell us which one is correct. We're given a scientific explanation, and it's not one that we work to solve. It doesn't feel like a satisfying solution because we haven't really ruled out the other possible options. We've just been told that this one is by far the most likely. In fact, it seems like a very hasty explanation, but we just have to believe it and all the implications that the central scientists say it leads to, because that is what's going on, so deal with it. Contrast this with Project Hail Mary again, in which we learn early on that the sun is rapidly burning out, and we only learn why this is through some pretty rigorous and painstaking exploration and theorizing on the part of our main characters. Once we've found the explanation there, we're convinced because it's the best possible remaining explanation consistent with the facts in the story. And even then, our protagonist remains cognizant that he might still be mistaken about a few of his specific assumptions, which he is, and we learn about that later. But he's, of course, not totally off the mark about everything because he and the other characters have done their due diligence to figure this out. Also contrast that with another famous example of plot point one, which is chapter four of the first Harry Potter book. Weird things are happening to young Harry. We don't understand why. Then a giant shows up at this cabin Harry's staying at. He shoots a spell out of his umbrella that gives Harry's evil cousin Dudley a pigtail. And at this point, when the giant tells Harry he's a wizard, we're like, yeah, I think that's right. I think Harry's probably a wizard because we've literally just seen this giant use magic to give his cousin a pigtail. And note that for a scientific or fantasy mystery to be successful in its own way, it doesn't have to be super complicated or even be scientifically that plausible, but we have to have eliminated the other possibilities. Unlike Hagrid in Harry Potter, who we can assume probably knows something and is thus telling us the truth, in the anomaly, when a scientist tells us the only explanation for this anomaly is that we're cut, at this point I'm going to say what the explanation is. So you better uh, leave and come back later if you want to read the rest of the book without spoilers. But hopefully I may have convinced you from my description that far that there's not really that much to spoil because someone is just going to tell you the answer in the second part of the book anyway, and you're not going to buy it. Unlike Hagrid in Harry Potter, who we can assume probably knows something and is thus telling us the truth, in the anomaly, when a scientist tells us the only explanation for this anomaly is that we're living in a simulation, but fails to show us why, this isn't really deserving of our complete trust. We should be skeptical. Furthermore, the scientists then proceed to elaborate on a whole bunch of other hasty assumptions. Well, this must be a test from whatever creatures are doing the simulation. There's no way that a computer program could possibly have an undetected bug, or that whoever is running it could just be messing with us for a laugh. And since it must be a test, well, we'd better act correctly or they probably are just gonna unplug the simulation and we'll be done for. Why would we assume that? If it's a test, couldn't they just as well unplug us if we get the right answer? There are just so many hasty assumptions in this second part of the novel that for this goal I'm calling goal one, the scientific mystery, I think we have to say that the novel tries and completely fails. Despite that, there's no reason that the novel couldn't succeed at goal number two. What if we really are all living in a simulation? What if we just accept this fact as if we were really convinced? I'm not sure it's the most exciting or original way that the novel could have gone, but given that it did, what does it mean for the world? How does it affect broader society? Unfortunately, the novel also takes a stab at this in the second and increasingly in the third part of the novel, the confrontation part. And again, these efforts fall short. We have a feeble discussion with religious leaders of various faiths that maybe could have turned out interesting, but instead the conversation just devolves into a shallow and totally unnecessary bickering among all the different leaders, including even the Buddhists about the correctness of their own faiths and the wrongness of all the others. Then we cut to a scene with some supposedly really smart, really, really smart, she's, I think she's at Princeton, so she's really smart, Meredith something or another, who just starts spouting off all these supposedly interesting questions that come up now, given that we're living in a simulation. But 
And this makes it worse. She's not really getting to the heart of what I would think of as the most interesting questions. This spouting off of questions is not only a bit annoying for the reader, who's basically just being told, here's all the things that you should think about, but that we're not going to think about because the third half of the show is coming up right after this break. It also makes Meredith feel not particularly smart or intellectual, even if we were buying that part of her character at first. Someone has told her she's living in a simulation. She believes it instantly, of course, because that person is a world authority on something or another. And her first question about it is whether it might be a simulation to see whether the Neanderthals or the Cro-Magnons prevail under certain parameters. Okay, maybe it's not that it makes her feel dumb. I guess it's just that I'm not sure I buy that this is where her mind would be going in such a situation. Nor do I buy that she's never even thought about this theory or even apparently seen The Matrix before. All the simulation stuff I feel is unnecessary for the novel in a distraction from what seems to be the question with more interesting potential. The question of, hey, we have two copies of all these people now. Yes, I'm not denying that it really is a big problem to solve of how this happened and everything, but the author could have chosen to leave that aspect outside of the scope of this book and to touch on it only briefly, which is what in effect happens in the end anyway, but it's just not said that way. But setting aside the question of how this happened and what that means, what are we going to do now in a world where we have two copies of a bunch of people? I think there's over 200 of them on the flight. What are the societal, moral, ethical, legal implications of this? I mean, this is wild. Of course, it'd be fine, too, for the author to choose not to explore that territory either. The author gets to choose which aspects of this complicated situation he wants to explore. But I think here, by trying to explore and mention every possible implication, he simply ended up leaving them at mere mentions, not exploring any of them satisfactorily. And I'm not even going to go into the shallow political explorations we see in part three of the book, because they're really not strong. In fact, reading this novel, you get the sense that the author came up with this idea of the anomaly first, which was a good, really good idea, and then developed this idea of how will the characters react when they meet their other selves, which was a good idea, and how will society react, which was also a good idea, although these ideas weren't ultimately executed quite as well. And then the author thought, but how do we explain this anomaly? What's the scientific reason for it? Oh, how about a simulated reality? That would be amazing. And then this idea of a simulation took root and seeped into the rest of the book in a way that wasn't thorough enough to be actually interesting, and instead just started to mess up stuff that was perfectly okay without this part of the plot. But luckily, we don't even have to speculate about this because an interview with Letelier for the New York Times reveals this to be exactly the case. I, I'll read a quote from him from the interview, which I'll also link below, where he describes the idea that inspired the novel to begin with. It would be interesting if I found my double awaiting me. How would I react? This was the genesis of a book he took one year to write. End quote. And yes, it would. And that is the strongest part of the novel by far. But then, once that idea was starting to take shape, I quote again from the same article, the explanation for the identical June flight was not easy, causing him a brief writer's block. Then an idea came to him, that the world is perhaps simulated and that we are on a biological level non-existent. As one of the characters observes, Descartes' I think, therefore I am, is therefore obsolete, replaced by I think, therefore I am almost certainly a program. And thus is born this half-baked simulation plot and pseudo-philosophical speculations that seep into the more interesting aspects of the novel from the second part onwards. But before I rant too much about this, what about that final possible goal that I came up with for science fiction writing? The goal of exploring how characters are affected by unexpected and unusual circumstances. That's where I think this novel comes closer to the mark, although it feels a bit too little too late at this point. But particularly in the third part of the book, uh, Letelier explores this more intriguing aspect that he's set up. How would it feel to meet a literal copy of yourself? How would you feel going into the experience? Would you find yourself particularly relatable? Maybe even want to become friends with yourself, like a long lost twin? Would you resent your other self for having stolen a life and even memories that until recently were wholly your own? Or maybe you would see your copy as a threat to your very existence. In this part of the book, we get to look at all these questions and how each character's personality and life situation leads him or her to respond differently to this shocking turn of events. And this part is great, but it all happens too fast, uh, without enough time to really sink in, and this is something that could have been different. 
I really wish Letelier had dropped this whole ridiculous simulation plot and left the global fallout as something looming in the background, but a topic that would be for another author to take on in a different story. By trying to force in this political crisis, he shortchanged his characters, which were the strongest part of the book, and for me, it ultimately limited what could have otherwise been an outstanding overall work. So yeah, I think this novel is quite ambitious, both in terms of character development and in the science fiction plot. And in one of those places, its ambition is largely successful, but in the other, it's self-defeating. A simpler science fiction thread would have been more satisfying and imbued the characters with new motivations and an altered outlook on life. And in one case, even an actual restoration to life. In spite of all that, though, I still enjoyed many parts of the book. But although after reading the first third of the book, I was hoping I'd be able to unconditionally recommend it, by the end, I'd have to amend that recommendation to just a maybe. If you do decide to read it, just know what you're going to get out of it and what you won't. Thanks for watching, and I hope you've been doing some good reading of yourself. Uh, until next time, happy reading.